Hi, guys. We recorded several episodes before coronavirus hit, and the content was fantastic, but it was not particularly relevant. While we thought this coronavirus was going to last for maybe a shorter period of time originally than, than we do now, we feel like we shouldn't wait any longer to get this great content out there. So you're going to see these episodes uh, popping up over the next few weeks, and, and it's great content. I hope you enjoy it. I think that, you know, I mentioned this is the golden age of having data available, and, and that is true. We have never had so much available to us as destination marketers, but we also have to be careful. Um, you have to be prudent. You guys, I have been working on something for the last six months that has been such a giant project, but I'm so proud of it. I, I'm excited to announce that I've just released my book. It's called Touch Points, and it's the Destination Marketer's Guide to Brand Evaluation and Enhancement. And it is a comprehensive guide for destinations to look at their brand, evaluate what you've done, and make a very clear and detailed plan of action of how to fix it. And it's, look, I'm biased, right? Because I wrote it, but I think it's so good. I think it's a great guide, and I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. And I wanted to tell you guys about it. It's available on Amazon. Search Touch Points by Adam Stoker, and you'll be able to get that book for your destination. And I think it's going to be, especially for, for anyone that is trying to look at their brand holistically, this is the book for you. So check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker. I'm excited to be with you today. For those of you that have not yet left us a rating or a review and you've listened to several of our shows, guys, it's time to click the button. We, we got to leave the, the rating or review. We're, we're excited about the continued increase in listener numbers, and we want to keep that snowball rolling. And so if you're jo- enjoying the content, enjoying the show, please make sure that you leave us a rating or a review. Uh, The other thing that I want to remind everybody is we have a LinkedIn group called Destination Marketers, and we have posted some really fun content from the show. Whenever we have something tangible that you can't really access audibly, we'll go post the link to that in the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group so that you can find that information, go back and look at it, uh, and follow up from what you learned on the show. So those are just a couple of reminders I wanted to give everybody. We've got a great show planned for you today, and it's actually a company that I have been wanting to get on the podcast now for a long time, and we were able to make a connection and we've got a great guest. His name is Matt Clement, and he is from Arrivalist, one of the premier organizations in the industry. And Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Oh, we're excited to have you. We got a lot of questions today, and I think a lot of our listeners are going to to be really interested in what you have to say because there's so much value in the technology that you guys provide for the industry. So I'm excited to dive in, but before we get ahead of ourselves, you know, we've got a little icebreaker question we like to ask everybody when we start on the show. What is your dream destination, Matt? If you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? Uh, I love that question. Well, I uh, my primary hobby uh, when I'm not uh, not working is um, is something called overlanding, and uh, I don't know how many of your listeners overlanding. You know, yeah, it's it's kind of a niche thing, um, but essentially it's it's uh, travel, uh, you know, kind of independent um, backcountry travel using your vehicle, um, where you spend you know as much time as you as you can get, uh, you know, in terms of time off, exploring the wilderness and and spending time, you know, out there. Um, so do you have one of those big Mercedes vans with the bed in the back? And, like, is that you, Matt? I, I'm definitely not posty. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely not. I'm not the uh, REI version of Post Malone. No, <laughs> um, no. You know, I so a, a lot of folks uh, in tourism probably know I have a, a, a probably an unhealthy love affair with my Toyota 4Runner um, that I've affectionately named Betty White. Um, <laughs> nice. Betty, Betty White, the, the white forerunner. But uh, yeah, you know, my, my dream destination would be a taking a summer to um, just travel through the backcountry of British Columbia, the Yukon and, and Alaska. Um, you know, I've I've got friends who have had that opportunity. My sisters had that opportunity to go and 
and really just see those natural wonders that are just just everywhere up there. Um, so that would be my dream. If I had if I had the time to go do it, um, I would love to just get lost for about three months up there. Yeah. Have you have you ever driven on the Alaskan Highway? I have not. I uh, the Dalton Highway is something I again would love to do, and uh, and someday I will. Someday I will. But uh, that's my dream for sure. You know that I, I've got a unique uh, perspective on what you're trying to do because in 2005 I was in the middle of of going to school and I was walking down the hall and and a guy was standing there handing out brochures and he said you can drive tour buses in Alaska this summer and I grabbed a brochure and walked into my next class and there was a guy that I had just barely met I uh, you know I'd known him for a couple of days it was the beginning of the semester and I said hey you want to go to Alaska this summer with me and he said I'm in. And we went to Alaska and drove tour buses that summer and had the time of our lives. And we drove on the Alaska Highway uh, on the route between Fairbanks and Skagway. Uh, and it was just, it, it was amazing. Uh, we got to see so much of Alaska. You know, we, we kind of, we leveraged our uh, position as tour bus drivers uh, and, and said, hey, you know, if you guys will let us go on your tour, we'll talk about your tour when, when we're driving our buses. And, and we did that. And we got to go on like small planes flying through the canyons of Denali National Park. And, and we, got to, we got to go on this Jeep safari tour. It, it was so fun. If, if, it's, if it's your dream destination, you've got to make it happen. It, it is such an incredible place to visit. Well, I, you know, I think what's so important these days, um, you know, my, my wife and I have a daughter who's uh, 11 years old in sixth grade, about to finish up sixth grade. And we got into this three, four years ago because this particular generation, more than any other, I think, before it is so inundated with everything electronic. And we really wanted to give her um, or provide her experiences that disconnect from that and and really reconnect with nature. And, and, and you know, and I think the other part of it is honestly raising a little girl to be a woman one day. You know, my, my thing is, is that if I can teach her not to be afraid of bears, you know, um, <laughs> then I, I, job. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a lot less to worry about as a, as the dad of a, of a woman, you know, in this, in this world. And, and, uh, that's kind of what got us into it. And it's, it's a real passion of ours for sure. But, um, uh, yeah. Really cool. Really cool. And, and as a girl dad, I actually just ordered my, uh, my shirt and there was an Instagram ad for these shirts that had Kobe's outline on them and it said girl dad. Uh, and I just couldn't help but but buy a shirt. So <laughs> That's awesome. I just got mine. I've got three girls and we just had our first boy. And so, yeah, I, I can relate to some of the emotions you're going through there. Absolutely. Tell me, Matt, your favorite place you've ever been. You know, we, we talked about Alaska as your dream destination. What yeah. about a, a place you've been? Oh, man. You know, I, I have to, to go ahead and say New Mexico. Um, all of it. <laughs> really? Um, you know, I, I, look, there are so many beautiful places around our country to go visit, but New Mexico for me, as someone who's very specifically interested in backcountry travel and the freedom that it provides, it, there's just very few places um, that are as, that are accessible to me as someone who lives here in Texas as New Mexico. I mean, um, my, my favorite probably, I mean, if you were going to put me down on kind of where uh, you know, I love Albuquerque, Santa Fe, but I, we do spend a lot of time in the area around Cloudcroft, Ruidoso, New Mexico, Carlsbad. That whole region is um, relatively undiscovered. You can go uh -huh. and, and you can just camp anywhere. Um, you can see all sorts of beauty, biodiversity. I mean, you can start in some place like Cloudcroft at 10,000 feet. And in the space of 30 minutes, you're, you know, on the desert floor in white sands a yep. completely different environment. And so I just think it's, um, I mean, it, there's wonderful food, um, the culture, the people, the biodiversity, the um, open spaces. There's just so much about it. Um, I, now, I'm also a huge fan of Colorado. Uh, everybody is. Yeah. Um, you know, Arizona, the American West in general. But, but New Mexico really does hold a special sp spot in my heart for you know, just the experiences I think we've had there as a family are things that, um, you know, I really treasure. Well, you know, you're not going to believe this, Matt, but I have actually spent a lot of time in Ruidoso, New Mexico, and Alamogordo, and the White Sands area. Uh, 
because we had a client based in Alamogordo, New Mexico years ago, and we, we drove up, they were the, the cable provider, uh, and we drove up to see Rio Doso, and on the way up there, I saw the biggest elk I've ever seen in my life on the way up to Rio Doso. And anyway, what a cool place, and you know, pretty undiscovered, and, and I'm surprised that you and I have both been there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a neat place. I recommend it highly to anyone that's not been before. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's, let's get into a, a, a little bit more about you and your background and why you got into tourism. Let's, let's just start with who you are, Matt, and, and how you ended up in your role today. Sure. Well, the, the, the thing that a lot of people might not know about me is that I, my degree is, is actually in aviation. <laughs> and, oh, wow. And I always joke when I tell people that, that I, I guess I'm in tourism because I wasn't a very good pilot, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the truth of the matter is I, I was in, uh, in college, uh, getting an aviation degree and, um, was actually headed to the airport on the morning of nine 11 to go fly. And, you know, in an instant, everything changed. And oh, wow. I, uh, got out of school uh, a couple of years later. I, I spent an extra year or two, um, getting some, some education in business went to work for American Eagle Airlines. Uh, you know, I really couldn't find a job. Uh, it was it was such a tough time that, um, you know, my first job out of college was putting gas in airplanes at a local airport. Um, went to American Eagle, thought I'd hit the jackpot working for $9.25 an hour, you know, at working a gate at DFW Airport, getting called all sorts of names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and and I left... I left <laughs> I left the airline pretty quickly. You know, I did about a year at American Eagle and, and it, you know, I have a lot of respect for the people that work there. It's a very, very tough business. And then I kind of, you know, went on walkabout professionally for a long time. I, I did a, a stint as a commercial loan officer for a bank. I worked in newspaper advertising. Um, you know, around 2008, I was working at a hotel uh, in sales. And of course, you know, 2008, we know how that went. Um, yep. And then was laid off uh, for about 24 hours. I was unemployed. I was fortunate enough to um, get picked up by uh, a local racetrack and casino called Oakland back home in Arkansas. And, and that was my break. That was my lucky break. I went to work for Oakland, right around the time that the gaming laws in Arkansas were changing to allow casino style gaming at racetracks in, in the state. And we built um, a casino operation really kind of from the ground up. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to work for some really brilliant people, really brilliant business people and, and really super brilliant database marketers. And, and that's where everything started for me. And, and really why I'm at Arrivalist today is it all comes back to that. Because what I learned in the gaming environment was that knowledge is king. And if you can understand what um, makes your, your customers tick, you know, do they prefer Camaros or Corvettes or, or Camaros or Fords or John Deere's or Husqvarna, um, you know, how can you tweak your marketing specific to the knowledge that you're taking in? you know, I saw firsthand what that can do and the power of that. And so I worked in the gaming industry for about four years and I did decide after about four years, close to four years that I um, really wanted to do something more positive. In my opinion, personal opinion, I just wanted to do something where I felt like I could give back to a community more, um, and if I'm just being honest, I wanted to work somewhere where my daughter could come visit me in the office before she was 21. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, it, it, the gaming industry is very, very tough. It's a, uh, it's a very tough life. You know, your hours are weird and long and you come home smelling like smoke. And, and so again, just like the airline industry, I have a lot of respect for the people who have made a career in gaming because it is, it's a very tough business. Um, it's a very smart business. It's a very demanding business, but I, um, but not for everyone, right? Like it's, 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 it's not, not a career for everybody. Yeah. It's not for everybody. And I had, you know, in that capacity of working for the casino had become friends with the local, uh, convention, visitor bureau folks. And I just became really 
interested in their line of work and, and what they were doing and what it meant to the community. And, and I became really good friends to this day. I still am. It's a terrific gentleman named Steve Harrison, who's the CEO of Visit Hot Springs. And I just felt like, man, this is a really cool business and I want to do it. And so I was fortunate to get a job at Experience Fayetteville, which is the DMO for uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas in Northwest, in the Northwest part of the state. Really beautiful. And that's where I cut my teeth on the DMO side. And I spent about a year and a half there. And one of the first things I realized is that coming from a gaming environment, casino environment to, to a CBB was, wow, we don't know near as much <laughs> in this business. We don't have near as much information at our fingertips as I did in the casino environment. And I transitioned, you know, I, I was fortunate uh, again to, um, meet a man named Bob Jamison, who's the CEO of Visit Fort Worth. And we became friends at uh, Destination uh, International, used to be DMAI's annual conference back in 2012 when it was in Orlando. And we became friends and, and there was an opportunity to go to work for him in Fort Worth. My wife is from Texas. So we thought, hey, how, how cool would it be to, to move to Texas and be able to work in a larger market? And was double fortunate to work for a gentleman named Mitch Witten, who's the CMO, uh, or I'm sorry, now he's uh, executive vice president for marketing and strategy there at Fort Worth. And when we got to Fort Worth, what I realized is that um, even though it was a bigger organization, more budget, uh, bigger market, more product, a lot of the same problems were still there. We, we still really didn't know to the level that I was used to in the gaming industry who our customers were, how long were they saying, how effective was our marketing truly at getting them to come to Fort Worth. Um, And not only that, but even though we had a much larger budget than Fayetteville, I was now in Texas where, you know, you're competing with um, some very, very established and well-funded players. Um, Right. Dallas, Houston, Austin, um, San Antonio. And so we, we had to be competitive in that environment, but with less budget. And I always said we were the Oakland A's of Texas tourism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're playing money ball. Everybody else is, is wasting that money, huh? Well, I, you know, I don't think they were wasting. I don't want to say they were wasting that yeah, money. That's aggressive. But, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> but I would say that they definitely could outspend us. And so to compete, we had to really make sure that we, we weren't wasting a drop. And, uh, so Mitch went to e-tourism that year and came back and he said, you know, I had this crazy conversation with a guy named Cree Lawson. He's got this company called Arrivalist and it's kind of nuts. He said, but he's, you know, Cree's telling me that they can tell us if people who have seen our advertising and visit our website actually physically show up in Fort Worth. And he said, would you would you schedule a call with Cree and just check this out? He says, I don't know if it's, you know, if it's crackpot or if, if it's for real, he says, it sounds really interesting. And so I, I scheduled that call and the rest is history. <laughs> Got it. Um, you know, we, we went on to um, certainly we, we went on to become the fourth client of a rivalist. Uh, we were one of the first clients of, of Adara's impact product as well. And I was very fortunate to work for an organization at Visit Fort Worth that was willing to um, try new things, to invest in new technologies. And we really put it to work. I I feel like at the time that we were doing things that really not many other people were doing. And it was super effective. Um, We were able to, to really understand how our marketing affected visitation to the city and um, we learned how to optimize our media buys, you know, to um, to be smarter, to be more tactical, but but also strategically more sound. It it really changed the game for us. Um, and uh, so, from yeah, a background sorry, perspective, I'm, that's it. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to jump in because you said so many interesting things in your process, and it's always fun for me to to hear. You know, people go through experiences in their career that while it may not be something that they want to do for their lives, it sets the table for the job that they eventually end up at. And I'm just thinking about your experience in gaming and how while you decided, hey, this isn't the career for me, I'd like my daughter to be able to come visit me. Those four years gave you the knowledge to go to Fort Worth and recognize an opportunity 
to work with Arrivalist and why you needed it, right? And and, and I just think mm-hmm. that's so fascinating. The the steps that go into a career when you're in a moment in your career, you don't exactly see how it's going to affect the big picture. But you're now looking back on your career, you can you can see how important that four years in the gaming industry was. It's just so fascinating to me to to hear some of those experiences. Well, you know, I, I, people ask me about my career and, and I, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, I think I was luckier um, rather than, than <laughs> how good I was or, or smart I was. It was mostly, you know, some lucky breaks and then trying to, you know, be hungry and take advantage of, of the opportunities that were, you know, given to me. The gentleman that I worked for at Oakland, his name was Bobby Geiger, and unfortunately, he he passed about a year and a half ago from ALS. Um, but Bobby would sit down with me, and and we, I have such good stories. One of the stories I'll tell you very briefly. One of my jobs at Oakland was to, um, I, I don't think I'll get in trouble for saying this, but was to really despise on rival casinos and. <laughs> one of the things that Bobby sent me to do was to go, I would go to like Tunica for instance, or Shreveport and I would take a bankroll and I would play on specific games. Um, very specific. And I, and Bobby would, would figure out the math. And, and so I would sit down at a $1 game or a $5 game and I'd play X number of, of times. And then I would leave. It didn't matter if I won or, or not. Now, one time I did hit a jackpot, which was very weird. <laughs> Let me just tell you. <laughs> did you get to keep that, or did was that? I did bad not. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get to keep that money. Um, <laughs> uh, I did not get to keep the money. But um, okay, I just got to ask, how much was it? It was a ten thousand dollar jackpot. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not get that to keep. That is I, wild. Don't think I didn't ask. <laughs> I oh, did. Man. But the reason that we were doing that is because in the gaming industry, uh, when you put a player's card in a slot machine, everything is being tracked and the value of the offers and the type of profile that is assigned to you as a player is very, very dependent upon the behaviors you exhibit, um, how often you play, how often you visit. And we did this because then those casinos would send me marketing offers in the mail. And we built our loyalty program based on the feedback that we saw from our competitors sending us offers in the mail. Wow. And now that's some serious competitive research. <laughs> it, I like it. 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 Uh, I, I will also tell you, I was not allowed to take the offers like free cruises or <laughs> trips to such. Yeah, I was strictly you forbidden know, to do any of it. I, you know, Matt, you talk so nicely about your boss back then, but but I got some real issues with some of his decision making on what you could do. <laughs> it was uh, it was a very regulated experience, believe me when I tell you. But wow. I was very very incredibly fortunate to work for a visionary like Bobby, and and to learn at his side. Um, yeah, I, I owe everything to him, to be honest. And and even that experience, Matt, uh, of monitoring activity and understanding how important knowledge of the customer is, and the extent that casinos will go to 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 have that knowledge, once again, really set the table for ending up at a rivalist. And I want to have you tell us just big pick because I've got listeners from all over the world, destinations mm-hmm. big and small. Some know what a rivalist is. Most probably know what a rivalist is, but a lot of them probably also have some misconceptions about what a rivalist is and the different types of products that are available through a rivalist. So can you give me just kind of a 30,000 foot view and then options that destinations have of how to utilize a rivalist? Sure. Um, So we are a visitation intelligence company utilizing geolocation data from mobile devices to provide both intelligence on the visitor. So I just reworded visitation intelligence. Sorry, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) But but we're providing intelligence uh, on visitation to a destination. So where do people come from? How long do they spend in the market? Where do they go while they're here? How does geography and seasonality affect those variables? And and we we can utilize that to help uh, destinations really... um, get a strong grip on what their market looks like and to be able to utilize that to 
build their marketing strategies, to adjust their strategies, to report that out to stakeholders, to justify the things that they're doing. More recently, we've we've seen that visitation intelligence be utilized for some very cool things like destination developments, um, you know, supporting an expansion of a convention center, for instance, or supporting new service at the local airport, um, you know, to uh, to use for advocacy for sustainable tourism initiatives. So really cool things. And, and, and I think what we're proudest of is that these are new uses of the data that the client uh, the clients invented. We we did. So you're not even selling this application of of your of your data. They're coming up with creative ways to use it. That's pretty cool. It, it's you know I think that's something that we're the the most proud of is is it's the clients that are coming up with these cool things, and and they'll they'll send us an email and they'll say hey you know we we need to show a local political adversary that it's not tourists that are contributing to overcrowding in a park. Can you help us? And it's like, Hey, we can, we can. And, and then you go from there. So, so visitation intelligence has really become, I think so central to what we do, but what we were built on and what we continue to do to this day is, is media measurement. And in 2012, when the company started, the issue that we had in the DMO industry was that we, you know, as DMOs, we don't have a cash register um, like our hotel and attractions and museum partners all do. So we, we have to be able to market effectively without a true point of conversion. Right. And in 2012, um, if you had a marketing campaign, the, the way that you would decide the success or failure of that campaign came down to things like maybe on-site bookings or um, click-through rate. Maybe it was time on site um, or, you know, how many, you know, times people were clicking your ads on Facebook. Those were really the things that we had. And the problem with those metrics is that although they have their place, they're not useless, but most of the time they don't translate and then the thing that we need to know the most, which yeah, is... Yeah, what matters is visitors, right? Visitors, <laughs> right? yeah. Did they actually show up in the market? And so in 2012, Arrivalist was launched to provide that metric. And so on the media measurement side of things, we provide a conversion metric that is very holistic in nature. So we are you know, lodging agnostic. We are transportation agnostic. It doesn't matter um, if they stay in an Airbnb or a Hilton or, you know, a boutique hotel. It doesn't matter if they, you know, got an airplane to come to the destination or if they drove in their car, um, you know, or in my case, a forerunner. Um, <laughs> Betty, but, White. Betty White. Betty um, White. Yeah. But, you know, we look at um, folks who are interacting or, or not even interacting, but just being exposed to your, your media. So if they, they see your advertisements with your, your media partners, you know, Expedia, TripAdvisor, uh, Sojourn, Adara, whomever you're working with, um, you know, people who are interacting with those ads or, or being exposed to those ads, people who are visiting your website, ultimately we want to know, do they actually show up in the destination? And, and, and this works with, with digital ads specifically. It works. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. It's, it works, you know, in the digital realm. Uh, what's really exciting is that in the last year or two, we have started to work and successfully and doing it quite a bit now with connected devices. So smart TVs, we work with oh, interesting. You know, the, the Pandoras of the world. Um, we have actually now worked with connected out of home. So programmatic billboards, which is pretty wild. Um, yeah. But the the way that this has really evolved in on the media measurement side is that early on what we did is to say, okay, someone was exposed to an ad or a series of ads and then arrived. And and we would measure that um through a metric called APM, so arrivals per thousand impressions. And I always laugh, you know, or, or used to laugh and, and say this was like CPM's smart cousin. <laughs> Okay. And it was a very effective metric. It was a much more fair metric. It was more fair to um, the DMO. 
it was more fair to the media providers, the good media providers. They have, you know, quality inventory. It was more fair to the agencies um, that maybe were working on behalf of DMOs. Because previous to this, if you were doing a brand awareness level advertisement um, and you were using click through rate as a primary metric to say this either was a success or a failure, or even if you were doing it with someone who utilized maybe, you know, post campaign reporting, you know, with bookings made at an OTA, if you were doing a brand level advertisement, there's a good chance that someone who sees that is not going to interact with it um, that first time or first few times that they see your brand there, right. you know, especially those that don't have a strong call to action, for instance. And it was very hard to know if those advertisements were successful or not. And oftentimes they were either labeled failures or people would say, well, we can't measure this. We just kind of have to accept this as a cost of doing business, which doesn't go over that well with, with boards um, in my experience. Yeah. So this provided a way to measure those things where the consumer might not be taking a very direct action right off the bat. And we were able to measure, you know, the, that impression over a period of months, even years to see how it would influence, you know, visitation, even if that took three months, six months, nine months and, and all the subsequent impressions. Okay. You're sparking an interesting question for me sure. then, or at least that I find interesting. Our listeners might not find it interesting, but here we are. Um, so you, what have you learned in that process? Because you're monitoring over, you said, you know, months, years from that first impression. What have you learned about the buying cycle for travelers in that process? Well, I think that in travel, the biggest challenge that we have is that if you're Starbucks and you run an advertising campaign um, on Facebook or just online, there's a pretty good chance you can convert that day. I see an ad for a $2, you know, latte at Starbucks. I can get up and say, I'm going to go to Starbucks and convert that day. Right. If I'm in Texas and, you know, I'll just pick a city at random. Let's just say San Francisco, cool town. If San Francisco shoots me an ad on a Thursday afternoon and I'm like, oh, wow, I want to go to San Francisco. As much You're not jumping on a plane on Friday. <laughs> I mean, not at my salary, but <laughs> maybe for some people they can. But I think for the vast majority of us, we see that if I see an ad for Australia, um, which I know Josh, you know, mentioned he, he Josh Collins, who, who did an interview with you a while back, you know, he said he would love to go to Australia. If Josh sees that ad on Thursday, yeah, he's, he can't get on a plane realistically on Friday and go to Australia. So we have these really long conversion uh, periods and, and there's a lot of factors that go into that. I mean, if you're, if you're a city like uh, Fort Worth, you know, where I live or maybe in Oklahoma city, um, you know, Austin, you have big drive markets. That can be a very different cycle than if you're Puerto Rico or if you're Alaska, somewhere that's more dependent upon uh, airplanes to get people to your destination um, that are maybe, a, you know, where you, you have people that are going to take a longer time. So generally, as a best practice at, at Rivalist, we really like to look at, you know, post-campaign reporting, you know, two months or so. And then even after that, to continue to report back on how a, a, a given campaign is doing, you know, for for a while. I, I think the question really becomes kind of when does an ad, um, you know, if, if an ad is, is kind of that seed, at what point do you kind of say, OK, you know, someone saw an ad a year and a half ago. Does it really count? And maybe not just that ad by itself, but if that ad was the seed that then got them to visit a website and then they got retargeted, if that ad becomes that first touch point in a chain, a long chain sometimes of touch points, then it, it still continues to be valid. And, and so, you know, generally speaking, I think that what's very, very difficult for a lot of digital metrics, you know, the, the legacy metrics is that they're just not very well suited for the environment right. that we operate in. Um, right. Well, let, let me ask you a follow-up question sure. then. Um, you know, attribution, especially in tourism, has become such a 
hot mm-hmm. button, right? It, it's and, and you talk about the reason, uh, and, and that's why uh, Arrivalist started is because vanity metrics just weren't cutting it, right? My fear for a lot of destinations who get caught up in attribution, my fear is that they'll be looking at it from a last click standpoint. And you touched on this a little bit, but uh, to give everybody some some frame of reference here, the last click attribution model is that 100% of the credit for a visitor is given to the last touch point that you can track before someone made a buying decision. And so if I'm understanding correctly, Matt, Arrivalist gives you the ability to track that. What what was your trigger event that led to the purchase? And, and you, I, I want to make sure that destinations understand that last click is not a holistic view of the buyer journey. And I'm, I love some of the things that you're doing to track the full buyer journey. Do you have, and I might be getting a little a little deep here, but do you have an attribution model that you've developed for destinations to attribute credit across their media plan? Sure. So I think the discussion between first touch and last touch is one where if you get a lot of marketers into a room, they're all going to have their opinions about it for sure. At Arrivalist, we've really subscribed most to a, a multi-touch model, which is probably the Switzerland of, of the argument. Okay. Um, and what that means is that we really give equal value to all the, the touch points. You know, from that first touch point to the last one, we try to assign equal value to all of them with with the belief really being that, you know, no one sees one killer ad typically and then makes a decision to travel. I think what's more likely... Uh, on the whole, you know, in a typical situation is that someone might see a really cool ad, um, you know, that sparks the imagination. Maybe they decide to visit a website, they get a retargeting ad, they start to search, um, which then opens up even more opportunities to target them. And it really all kind of, it's it's one very interconnected ecosystem. Oh, I'm really glad you, you're looking at it that way, because I think so many people get caught up in the last touch that it doesn't give them a clear picture of what actually led to their success. So yeah, that that's really good to hear. Well, I think, uh, you know, look, I, I'll put it this way. I live in Fort Worth. If, um, you know, my friends in Denver, um, well, we'll go further afield. Let's say my friends in Seattle uh, or Vancouver, you know, send me an ad that says, hey, we've got $200 hotel specials in Seattle, um, which would be an amazing deal, by the way. But, you know, if I had never seen anything else from them and I wasn't really that familiar with Seattle or Vancouver um, or, or you know, Montana, I don't know that I would be as likely to take action on that ad, even if it's a great deal, versus if I, you know, I live in DFW, I, I'm currently seeing these really cool television spots for Montana and, and occasionally I see some some digital spots from them as well. And it builds that sense of imagination of, how cool a place like Montana is or Seattle or any of these destinations that snowballs. And then ultimately I make a decision. So for me, I, I don't subscribe as much. I don't put as much weight on the last touch um, concept. I, you know, uh, you know, I respect everyone's opinion for sure, but for me, it's, I think multi-touch is a, a much more fair way of doing it. Makes sense. Makes sense. But I also know that attribution isn't the most important thing that you do, do even though it's a really great feature of, of what your data provides, there's a more important use, right? Absolutely. I, I think that for as imp- important as media measurement has been, the access to visitation intelligence powered by geolocation data has really changed the game. And and I'll give you an example of that. So you know, whereas we used to to gather intelligence after a campaign to see how it did, um, and then we would take those learnings and apply them to the next campaign. So you know, what what resonated, what didn't, um, what markets did we see more visitation from or less visitation from? With geolocation data and and some of the enhancements that we've made to the the platform in the last couple of years, now we have this always on source of information. Um, where we take this enormous panel of users, um, tens of millions of, of users and all of their devices and, and in an aggregated, and it's worth saying in this day and age, um, you know, completely privacy compliant way, we're able to see very, in a very granular way, in a very accurate way, where they're traveling, 
um, how much time they're spending in those places, where they're going while they're in the destination. And, and that's really powering a lot of neat things that I, you know, I mentioned that at the start of the interview um, where destinations now can, before a campaign is launched, you know, look at the data and it helps them prioritize what markets they want to be in, where, where do they want to spend their money? And if you're uh, the state of Illinois or if you're Chicago and you understand that people from Texas don't come to Chicago to go to Six Flags because they have a Six Flags, but people from Wisconsin do, now you have this, the, these sources of information that, that it's very on time to make those decisions about what that creative looks like, what's that messaging look like. And, and if you combine that with you know, other sources of information too, and I, I think it behooves me as someone who works in primarily quantitative data, so numbers-based data, to, to mention that I think that there's enormous value in qualitative research as well you know, the, the human side of things. Um, when you can combine that, and, and really we're in this golden age of data right now, both from a qualitative perspective as well as, as quantitative, um, man, you can be so effective in ways that even just five or 10 years ago would have been hard to have dreamed, you know, what was possible. Even if you're a smaller destination, um, which, you know, I think it's also worth saying that, you know, your listeners who are maybe working at a smaller destination, they're working at those fable, those Fayettevilles of the world that have this amazing product, but maybe not, you know, a, a Dallas sized budget. Right. Um, it wouldn't, you know, look, you can't have someone who lives in Texas, not make a, you know, biggest Dallas <laughs> reference. Um, even for smaller destinations now, things like visitation intelligence, um, can really be transformative for even you know more limited budget situations. So um, almost just as important, or maybe even more important than having your media attribution, which obviously you know it's important because you're spending a lot of money. You want to make sure that it's being spent effectively. But using data to craft your creative, your messaging, and even your geographic locations that you're planning your media buys is incredibly critical and you guys provide the ability to have that visibility. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that if you're working at a smaller destination or a larger one, really everything in between, it, it has never been more important. What we've seen in the industry is that our boards and our community stakeholders, our politicians on local and state levels, national levels, they really want to know that you you know where you're spending your money, they they want you to have that data based background. It's it's gone from a buzzword, you know, to really a, a, something that you have to live by, and 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 so I think that's really been the big difference now. And so with the way that smaller destinations, big destinations, can utilize all of this stuff, it's so cool um, because you know when I went to work in Fayetteville uh, in 2012. I got there and and I cracked open, I mean, the visitor profile was in a binder in a closet and it was five years old. Wow. And, and so at the time we, we really, we didn't know who, who our visitor was. We didn't know what experiences they wanted from us. And so we didn't have a really strong rudder. And, and now I think, and I, and I would assume there's a lot of destinations that were in that same, same boat. And now we have these very affordable, uh, you know, relatively affordable sources of information that can be put together um, in ways that are so impactful. So if you are a destination, for instance, that, um, you know, has a limited budget and let's say, you know, hey, we want to crack open a new market or we want to explain why maybe we're going to invest heavier in our drive market and we want to go to our board and we want to say, hey, we want to we want to spend this money to support a drive market. And let's just say, for instance, that board says, well, you know, hey, we want people from Chicago to come here and New York and San Francisco all the time. Which happens all the time, right? You've always got somebody that has this idea of, <laughs> you know what, there's this emerging market and it's like, how, how do you know? <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you provide that. Sorry, finish your thought. Well, no, I, I look, it's, it's that having a source of truth to, you know, we as DMO marketers, 
um, we still answer to these folks and, and these folks, you know, are smart in their own right. But if we can go to them and say, here's why we're doing the things that we're doing. Um, here's why we're investing so heavy in the drive market. Here's why we're not going to put money in this particular origin market next year, because, you know, the numbers suggest that it's not going to provide a stronger return. It, we can start to do those things preemptively instead of, you know, just saying, well, just listen to us. Uh, you know, we know what we're doing and, and that doesn't always work. And, and so then what happens is that those people who say, well, we should be putting money in this exploratory market, and then you do it because they said you have to because you couldn't refute it. Um, and then it doesn't work out. And then they completely at that point forget that they, they told you to do that to begin with. Totally. Now it's like, well, why did we put money there? Well, you know, because you told us to. <laughs> so I think what's um, exciting in our industry is that Arrivalist and, and other research companies are providing um, these sources of truth that really empower destinations to not just learn things that provide them new direction and, and provide really powerful insights. But, you know, we're pretty good at our jobs, right? As DMO marketers. Yeah. Um, it's, it's providing validation of the things that we we know. Um, it's the ammunition you need in a lot of those meetings to be able to have the positive outcome absolutely. you're looking for. And, I think that something that's really been fun to watch in my in my position here at Arrivalist has been to see really smart marketers um, that have been enabled to do the things that they wanted to always do and needed to have a way of, of showing a board or showing uh, local stakeholders, this is why we're doing it, and then getting that buy-in. It's really exciting when that happens. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, well, Matt, we we are this is we could split this into three episodes, I think, and and talk for a long time because this is this is when I get to nerd out as a marketer here. But uh, I do want to make sure that before we we end our interview today, that we talk about just budget level expectations, right? And and if for the full gamut of your services, what budget ranges are people looking at? And then on, you know, if we're just getting the data side, which I know you guys have a pack, package where you just give access to the data, what does that cost? Uh, and, and then, you know, a, another important question is, at what point is data and technology too big of a portion of your budget? Sure. Well, for, I'll answer those questions kind of in reverse because I think it, it'll make, uh, makes more sense. Okay. I, I subscribe to the theory that, um, you know, if I take my marketing budget and I want to set aside a piece of that pie, I think that it's appropriate to spend somewhere in the neighborhood between 10 and 20% of that marketing budget on research. And I should emphasize here, I'm not saying 10 to 20% of your budget to a rivalist as much as I might like, right. you know, love that. Um, <laughs> but, but that wouldn't be prudent for me to suggest it, it's 10 to 20% really, I think. And that's, that's covering any type of qualitative research that you're doing, quantitative, you know, whether you're subscribing to sources of information on booking data, survey data, geolocation data from from places like Arrivalist. Um, so that's what I always suggest. And, and I think that's good practice. I think that you'll find that most um, other industries generally subscribe to that as well. For Arrivalist, our our product range goes from you know as you mentioned um, just just getting the visitation information, which we offer you know an always on dashboard that can be accessed twenty four seven that is updated regularly. So you know if you have a question that someone shoots you you know say a member of your board asks you on Tuesday, hey last month what percentage of people came to our destination from Dallas, you can answer that to, you know, much more comprehensive services. Um, so it scales, you know, I think it scales very nicely. Um, and, and if folks are interested, of course, you can, you can reach out to us and, and we'll be happy to, to help. Um, well, how, how does somebody reach you, Matt? Sure. Well, I'm pretty, pretty easy to find. Um, you can email me at matt at arrivalist.com. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you've got. And, and generally, you know, what we like to do is to see what does a destination need? What are they trying to accomplish? And, and then we try to tailor, you know, a package to, to match that. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. 
Well, th- this has been a lot of fun, man. I feel like we need to do a follow up episode and and for one, talk about your trip to Alaska once it's done and and hear how that went. Uh, but then, you know, I bet we could probably dive into multiple levels of this discussion and and even maybe even get into a you know a little bit of a comparison uh, among other technologies within the industry because I think people would be interested in hearing that. But I really appreciate you taking the time to come share some of your knowledge with our audience today. Absolutely, um, I would love to come back and talk more. There's it's a deep topic. I um, I will say there's one thing I would love to leave your audience with. Um, yes, please. You know. I think that, you know, I mentioned this is the golden age of having data available. And and that is true. We have never had so much available to us as destination marketers. But we also have to be careful. Um, you have to be prudent. Um, anybody who's doing digital marketing and the aughts or the, the double O's or whatever we call them these days, will remember when programmatic really boomed. And your local newspaper was calling you and saying, hey, we got programmatic and everybody was calling you. And what we found over time was that a lot of that was junk. And and in the time since, we've become very, very savvy about you know vetting out our media partners. And if you look across the destination landscape, the, the media partners that are available that you're seeing at shows are generally those that have been vetted and, and they've withstood the test of time. We're going through that now with data and you have to be careful. Um, with anybody. And so the thing I would, I would leave with your listeners is there's three questions I would ask anybody who comes to your doorstep, a rivalist included, um, offering data services. And, and those three things is, you know, one, I would ask them, how are you ensuring compliance with privacy regulations like CCPA and GDPR? Um, and if they don't have an answer for you, that's a major red flag uh, because this is so important. It's not going away. Second is, you know, how do you confirm the accuracy of your data, uh, especially geolocation data? How are you balancing the information that you're giving me? How do you know that um, the accuracy of the data, you know, that when you say someone arrived at my convention center, how are you confirming that accuracy? And then finally, how do you source your data and how do you verify its quality? Um, This is uh, important and, and really all realms of data, especially in geolocation data, where does that geolocation data f- come from? And, and how do you know it's it's quality data? Because there's an awful lot of noise in the marketplace. But those are the three things I would, I would implore anybody listening to ask of all of us in, in this particular industry. So thank you for letting me mention that. <laughs> Great advice. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it and uh, wish everybody well. Oh, no. Thank you, Matt. And, and and once again, we really appreciate all that you've shared with us today and would love to have you back at a later time. Well, this has been another great episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast, everybody. Thanks for listening. And we we keep trying to bring on, you know, the, the most important uh, people in the industry that have things to share uh, to help you guys grow as destination marketers and improve your marketing f- efforts. And I think we definitely got that today. So thanks everybody for listening and we'll talk to you next week.